Hello, I'm your host, Peter Komandowski, and welcome to Surviving Bad, where we explore stories of survival, hope, and inspiration. Today, we learn how communities respond to the epidemic of substance use disorder. Rachel Lundgren from Siouxland Cares in Northwest Iowa joins us to talk about community-based strategies and youth engagement in the effort to slow the epidemic of substance use disorder. Let's meet our guest. Rachel, welcome to the show. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much, Peter. So glad to be here. As you said, my name is Rachel Lundgren, and I'm the executive director of Siouxland Cares. So we're based in Sioux City, and we serve the whole tri-state area. Um, if you're not familiar with Sioux City, we border uh, South Dakota and Nebraska. And so North Sioux City is in South Dakota, South Sioux City is in Nebraska, and Sioux City is in Iowa. So we serve that whole region. We started over 35 years ago as a community coalition. And the focus actually came out of a United Way assessment in the area. So they were looking at what do we need in the Sealand area. And a big area of concern came up with substance use, especially at that time they were looking at underage drinking um, was a big area of concern. Over the years, in the last 35 plus years, we've dealt with a lot of issues around substance use and also bullying prevention was another area that really came up. In the past few years, our board has really had us focus on youth and families, but we do still serve everyone in the Sioux City region. When we meet together and talk with individuals, although our main focuses are bullying prevention and substance use uh, prevention, we focus on making our area a healthy, safe, happy, inclusive region for everyone in Siouxland. So we don't just focus on substance use, but rather the protective factors and targeting the risk factors that deal with substance use, bullying, and other issues that happen in our community. Now, the organization has been doing this for a long time. So there is sort of a legacy movement there. And the tri-state area has had its share of challenges. But there's something else that's happened, too. I mean, we go back to 30 years ago, about the time the Partnership for a Healthy Iowa began as well. We sort of knew the connections to the communities, the parents, the families, the schools, the churches. That's really changed nowadays, especially with social media and things. How much has that affected sort of how you work in the community? I think that has had a big impact. And I do think that there are actually areas where we could be even stronger in some ways because of social media. But as you said, there are downfalls in the fact that we don't always necessarily communicate face to face with each other. And we can't always build the same type of in-person connections that really bolster uh, connectivity between organizations, between individuals, and help uh, people to feel grounded in the community. As I mentioned before, we look a lot at protective and risk factors, and one of the big protective factors we looked at is connectedness. So when we are working with youth, when we are working with people in the community, we try to think, how can we make people feel connected, even when sometimes we can't be in person, which, as you said, can be a difficult and challenging scenario. You know, it's been sort of what some people would call a long and winding road or a never ending story. It seems like as hard as we work to prevent substance use disorder, what used to be called addiction and things like that, um, it, there's just, it, we just can't seem to get ahead of things. That doesn't mean we can't stop all the work we're doing because if we did nothing, God knows how bad this problem would be. But what do you think are some of the things that in the time you've been doing this that you've learned? it's gonna to take to sort of get ahead of the problem? I think one thing on the positive note is we can look at the data, we do our own use survey, and then there's obviously lots of other surveys that are done. So we have seen in our community in the past 20 years, we have seen a decrease in 30 day alcohol, past 30 day alcohol use for our youth and cannabis use. Um, so we do know that we can get our arms wrapped around things. One thing that I think we know is a challenge right now is with a bunch of new substances coming on the market all the time. It can be so difficult to even learn about the substance before our youth are exposed to it, before people in the community can even sometimes purchase it legally at um, convenience stores and other places. So that I think is something that we always have to work and focus on that we're going to talk in general about how to make healthy choices and make informed choices because we can't always talk about the individual substances that are available. Now, just as an idea, what are some of the emerging substances that are, would be new to people in the last few years? I think one that's not necessarily an emerging substance 
globally um, or even in the area's kratom, but we do see a lot of people who haven't heard about it before. So that's one thing that I know just when people are call about questions that has come up a lot frequently um, for us. And then we also work right next to poison control. So we do get a lot of questions too about different types of opioids that people have heard of. Um, there's always different variants that are coming out in the market. And then the other one that I hear a lot are different formulations of cannabis um, and different products that come out, whether they're different deltas or then also uh, just ways that people can utilize cannabis, whether it is um, using through like a gummy or some other type of edible. And that is definitely something that uh, parents have questions about. And uh, we try to provide information to them that they can access about cannabis products. Well, we're going to take a short break. We come back. We'll continue the conversation with Rachel. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss this. Malware and bots and worms. Oh, my. The wild, wild web can be a scary and complex place. And as our digital world expands, so too are the threats. Watch out. Trojan horse. That's why at Mediacom, we take security very seriously and monitor our networks around the clock to stop threats before they can affect you. Not today, Kid. Not all internet is created equal. We build ours to keep you connected and protected. If I could go back and change it all, I would. I, would. I think I'm gonna miss you the most. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. So sorry. Maybe it's just a little moment. I could go back and change it all. I could go back. I would. But I can't. Welcome back to Surviving Bad. I'm your host, Peter Komandowski, and we're talking with Rachel Lundgren from Siouxland Cares about the challenges Iowa communities face, especially after the turbulent times of the opiate epidemic and the COVID pandemic, which has really changed the way we connect with communities. Can you talk about how some of the things have changed for you in your role with Siouxland Cares? I think one of our biggest programs that we are so excited about is working with the Sioux City Mayor's Youth Commission. We've been able to do that for over 20 years in the area as well. So we work with youth from all the different high schools for the Sioux City Mayor's Youth Commission. And then we also have younger kids who are in the end of elementary school and middle school who are in the Sioux City Young Ambassadors who are mentored by the Mayor's Youth Commission. And that was definitely one area that was really impacted by COVID because big part of that program, we meet with them once or twice a month, depending on how different type of ways they're involved with it. And then we also have them volunteer. As we talked about before with preventative factors being connected to the community is a great way of um, preventing substance use. So the youth are expected to volunteer and they love it. So they've been able to volunteer in the community. They've been able to come in person to meetings. And then suddenly we couldn't really do that anymore. One great thing about the young people that we work with is they're really tech savvy, probably more than we are. So we were able to do more meetings online via Zoom and that sort of thing. However, they also were kind of Zoomed out because they were doing a lot of their schoolwork on Zoom as well. So we tried to balance by having certain activities where we could be in person, maybe outside with distance between ourselves at parks or somewhere else if the weather permitted, while also doing some different types of online meetings. However, it was definitely a challenge. And we have seen since then a drop in our numbers to a certain extent. So moving forward, we're really excited to be able to be back in person uh, after the COVID pandemic. One thing we also heard from the youth was that they felt extremely disconnected during that time, disconnected from their friends. They didn't necessarily get to do the same activities that they had before. And a lot of the youth felt either that they developed some more unhealthy emotional feelings, or if they already had a mental illness or something along that, that it got really exacerbated by feeling lonely. Uh, and then we do know that feelings of loneliness and isolation definitely contribute to substance use. It also made us realize that maybe some of the substance use was going to be different than what we talked about 
or dealt with in the past. So our party patrols were not necessarily the type of thing that we'd be dealing with during that time. Kids might still have been using substances, but it was in a different way. Maybe if they were using alcohol or vaping, they were doing it by themselves, filming it to put it on TikTok or something else like that. So we had to adjust how we thought kids might be using substances. We had to adjust how we were interacting with them. And we just really saw it constant feedback from the young people we work with because we might think something's going really well, but then they let us know, no, we don't, we don't really feel connected anymore. Yeah, we have some contact with global leadership in youth high-risk behavior. And they, they feel that uh, when the United States were a little bit behind in terms of the age we're approaching some of these behaviors, because they're seeing the inception of information related to high-risk behavior, basically coming off the internet and things like that, without any, any of the other side, the counterpoint, the healthy side in the schools or from the parents, has, has created a runaway problem. Now, we see a lot of Asian countries and European countries have moved forward at younger and younger ages to teach kids about the risks of all these things. And here we're just starting to get to it, but we're also getting to a time where governance is trying to not let a lot of these things come into schools too young, as if somehow we can shelter them from it if we don't have these conversations. How is this affecting what's happening in Northwest Iowa and the states that you work in? Because it's it's even harder today to get into schools and get the attention of, of young kids that are really thirsty for this stuff. They wanna know what they should be afraid of or what they should manage. Are they getting enough of that without more needed in the schools? I think it's really difficult. We work very closely with a lot of the schools in the area and the administrators who we've worked with have really wanted to have that information available. As you said, because of certain things in the climate, it's not always possible. Because of that, we've had to respond in certain ways to try to think how can we approach things at a community level and approach maybe organizations that work with kids uh, in the community, how and sometimes bringing information to those after school programs or different places where kids are because it can't always be in the schools. One other area that's been impacted is that we always do our youth survey every other year. And with um, changes, especially with Senate File 496 to have to have active consent to participate in Iowa, that's one thing that we're a little bit concerned with moving forward because we do ask questions about substance use and now moving forward, if we do it in the Iowa schools, they will have to have active permission from parents. We always did send a copy of the survey home and an option for parents to opt out, but now parents will have to actively give permission for their kids to participate in the survey. So those are some areas that um, have definitely been a challenge for us. Yeah, to clarify that, usually a parent would give permission for the school to do that at the beginning of the school year or, or not to survey the kids. Now, in this small window of like five days before and, and parents are busy and parents don't always have a chance to react as quickly as they can. They have to have, there's a small window of opportunity for parents to have to approve something before it's done. And obviously the parents that are less engaged are less likely to respond. The parents that are less engaged are also the parents that may have children facing more problems. So this may become a self-fulfilling prophecy that defeats the purpose uh, which they may have intended. Absolutely. What do, you, what do you think you can do? Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to take a short break and then come back and talk about that question. What can we do to help parents empower their kids to deal with some of these risks? See you all after the break. You don't want to miss any of this. touch the stove. You told me not to do drugs. You told me not to drink and drive. You gave me so many messages about how to stay safe. Why didn't you keep me safe by properly storing your gun? You won't read about my mom in the history books, but she's going to change history forever. 
You'll never learn about her in school, but she'll redefine everything we know. She's not a scientist or a doctor, but she's gonna help save a lot of lives. My mom works at Mediacom, and they're going to bring us one of the world's first 10G broadband platforms. Mom says, dream big. Welcome back to Surviving Bad. We're looking at substance use disorder and what people are doing to help our children and families overcome threats that are not only potentially deadly, but often targeting the most vulnerable Iowans, whether it be economically or simply our children. Rachel, what is some of the stuff that you're doing to help build some of these connections within the community that can help protect our kids? I think one thing that we mentioned before, and that is a huge area of focus is for us parents who historically are very difficult to access compared to accessing their kids. We know from some of our surveys and just from general feedback from the kids is even if it doesn't seem like young people are listening to their parents, they are. It's very important that parents feel like they can talk with their kids. We, as a lot of people have had this struggle, have struggled with how we can best access parents. There are some parents who already have um, availability to be able to get off work or come in the evening to in-person sessions, but lots of parents aren't able to do that, even ones who are concerned. Some things during the pandemic that I think were actually helpful was when we did have to record or do Zoom options, we did see an increase in the ability for parents to be able to access some of our content. So for example, in South Sioux City, they were seeing a problem with vaping and they wanted to talk about it. So instead of having an in-person parent night, they were able to do a Zoom parent night, which doesn't always have people able to access it at the time, but because they were able to send out a recording through social media, we did see a lot more use for parents to be able to watch that. We did realize though that parents also don't have necessarily time to watch a 30-minute video. So trying to, we're working on right now, putting in small clips together that we can put out via social media through the newsletters to parents um, that we think will be very helpful, both in substance use and bullying prevention. The other thing we do is every other year, we used to do it every year. Now we've moved to every other year is we do a parent survey of parents of high school kids to get the feedback from them about their attitudes and their thoughts about both substance use and bullying prevention with their kids. So we know what we're addressing. Uh, sometimes parents might have an idea that they're protecting their kids when the behavior that they're engaging in, even though they're trying to be protective, is actually more harmful to their kids. So we also have been participating um, with AC4C uh, Iowa uh, coalitions for change uh, that we um, have a campaign for parents want what's best for their kids, because we know that a lot of times parents aren't necessarily doing something that they think is harmful. Sometimes they might be engaging in a behavior like letting kids drink in their basement because they think it's safer than the alternative. Yeah, when we're looking at high risk behavior, it's a lot of parents grew up in a climate where we didn't see as many risks. I mean, let's face it, mental health is now a part of a natural conversation. And you know, people joke about the fact that, well, it's only a part of the conversation because we are talking about it. It's always been there. And that's really not true. The level of anxiety, the level of fear, the effects of the media on the anxiety and fear of children, the, the many different channels for bullying and aggression, uh, this has become a much more complicated world. And that, that sort of laissez-faire attitude that parents have, like, well, I did this, it's just a rite of passage for my kids, is really not relevant anymore, because we're learning that it's a very complicated landscape. And, and you guys work to address some of those issues when you work with kids. Absolutely. I think especially with the bullying, uh, the situation is very different from when a lot of parents were in high school or middle school themselves. With social media, it does make it so kids can never get away from it. They can never have that break. And so sometimes parents also, the reaction is, well, they just can't utilize the internet or use apps or do anything. And that creates another sort of problem with them feeling connected because everyone else has access. So one thing we 
did um, recently this past year with a group of other organizations. It wasn't just us, but we put out information specifically about how to have conversations about healthy internet and app usage with the kids, because we do also know that new apps are coming out all the time. Parents all, can't always track it. Kids know how to hide apps on their phone. So approaching it from explain to the kids why we want them to have healthy social media usage, explain to them why we want them to come to us if they do experience bullying, and then also putting out information for the parents about what to do if they find out that bullying is happening, the reporting process, because that's something that we see a lot too, is parents will be really concerned about bullying that's happening, but they don't know how to report it to the schools. Well, you know, I think this is a fascinating issue that you're really involved on all levels and trying to accomplish these goals. We're going to take a short break and, you know, we're going to ask Rachel to come back and share some final comments, insights, and inspiration. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss this. Watching MC22 is now easier than ever before. All Mediacom customers can watch local programming online anytime. Go to mc22.net, click Watch MC22, and log in with your Mediacom account. Not a Mediacom cable subscriber? Mediacom internet or phone subscribers can watch too. Your local programming leader, MC22, online at mc22.net slash watch. Malware and bots and worms, oh my. The wild, wild web can be a scary and complex place. And as our digital world expands, so too are the threats. Watch out, Trojan Horse. That's why at Mediacom, we take security very seriously and monitor our networks around the clock to stop threats before they can affect you. Not today, Rootkit. Not all internet is created equal. We build ours to keep you connected and protected. I don't remember how it started. Talk to Dad. Our back and forth. It always came back. Dad! You probably don't remember what you told me. That was perfect. But I heard every word. Welcome back. Today on Surviving Bad, we're talking about how communities respond to the epidemic of substance use disorder. Let's see what insights and inspiration our guest, Rachel, has to share. And Rachel, one thing that you really have as a mantra for your organization is connectedness, really connecting a lot of different moving parts in our communities. Talk a little bit about that, please. I think we're really fortunate in Siouxland that we just have an environment where people are willing to work together and organizations are willing to work together. So I feel very blessed about that. One thing that we really focused on is trying to get people from different sectors to realize that every single person in the community has an ability to affect change on the community and every different type of organization does as well. And some different organizations we work with are more obvious like schools, law enforcement, the health department, the city officials, all make sense for us to work with. But then we also have some other connections that have been a little bit less obvious, like the carpenters union, different attorneys in town, sports organizations. So with the carpenters union, for example, one one thing we've worked on is to try to get books. This has been something just across the whole community to get books to small children. It encourages families to read together. Um, not just improves literacy, but improves the family connection. And so the Carpenters Union, um, along with Siouxland Cares and Prime Age to Engage and other organizations, came and provided little free libraries for us. So there's just a lot of different ways that organizations that don't seem like it would necessarily align with a safe and healthy community can participate. We also contract with an organization called Source for Sioux Land that looks at community planning. And so one great thing with that is we look at all the different areas in the community, economic stability, education, health, safety, quality of life. And we can see how all of those things tie together. You can't affect something in the health bucket that we call it without also impacting the economic development bucket. So we've been able to work with the Chamber of Commerce. We've worked with lots of different organizations to say, what can we do together to make Sioux Land a safer, healthier place for our youth? 
We also, I think, with the ability to have Zoom meetings, have partnered with another organization, Growing Community Connections, and they have a great meeting every month that has hundreds of people who participate in each month of probably 130 people join on that call. So we can get people from a lot of different backgrounds information about what's going on in Siouxland. And then we also had to, as a community, mobilize a little bit differently during COVID to make sure that when we had resource lists, that they were available digitally. And that made us also communicate and talk to each other. All of the mental health providers had to communicate to how can we get this list available for individuals. And then also realizing well, how are we going to get out into the community? We can't just give it to other mental health providers, but we can give it to the police department. We can give it to the schools. We can give it to lots of different organizations. So if I can say one thing that's really impacted our ability to make change in our community is being willing to work with everyone and recognizing that everyone does have a piece of the puzzle to make our community strong and healthy. So anybody from the community can contact you if they wanna work on some of these issues and you're sort of a central clearinghouse for this stuff. Absolutely, and I think we have multiple organizations they can contact Sue Land Carries, they can contact Growing Community Connections um, and we can help you get involved uh, with something in the community that's important to you. Now you've had some years to work in the even at your young age, some years to work in the community, what's the stuff that gets you excited? What are the things that give you so much satisfaction? Because you're always so upbeat when you're talking about your work. I think I'm really lucky that we get to work with young people a lot. The kids are always really excited. Uh, we have one initiative going right now to um, enhance diversity and inclusion in our uh, Mayor's Youth Commission, and the kids are so excited about it that it was quarterly. Then they said, can we meet every month? And now they're saying, can we meet twice a month? Mm -hmm. And the idea that they don't have to be doing these things and they want to make change in the community is what really inspires me and gets me excited. There are a lot of really negative things working in substance use prevention. We see families torn apart. We see lots of negative things, but then we also in the prevention work get to see positives. We get to see kids excited about the future. And I think a lot of times that energy also um, rubs off on the rest of the community when they see people are excited to move forward. And I think we always see negative things, but if we can just make small changes, they ripple across the community. And with each small change, you see more and more positive things happening in Sealand. Wow, Rachel, that's powerful. I'm so glad you could join us today. And thank you all for watching. Check out our website, ahealthyiowa.org and keep your eye on Mediacom MC22 for our next episode of Surviving Bad, where we explore stories of survival, hope, and inspiration on Mediacom MC22, your local programming leader.